So I would like to convene this closed session of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for April 21st, 2022. Can I have roll call? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fulce. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Um, staff has none. Okay. This is the time for oral communications uh, from members of the public. I don't see any um, attendees. Um, Hood, we might give it just a few more seconds. Okay. I'm not sure whether there's nobody here or whether they haven't been let in yet, given that it's still on the 530. Uh, nope, now it's 531. So. Well, I mean, it's not uncommon that people don't show up for the closed session, so. Sure. But we can wait a minute or two. Uh, well, now that it's 531, I, I think um, they would have been able to access it uh, by now. Okay. All right. Well, still seeing no attendees, I think um, we'll go ahead and adjourn to closed session. So I'll see you guys on the other side. So I would like to convene this closed session of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for April 21st, 2022. Can I have roll call? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fulce. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Um, staff has none. Okay. This is the time for oral communications uh, from members of the public. I don't see any um, attendees. Um, Hood, we might give it just a few more seconds. Okay. I'm not sure whether there's nobody here or whether they haven't been let in yet, given that it's still on the 530. Uh, nope, now it's 531. So. Well, I mean, it's not uncommon that people don't show up for the closed session, so. Sure. But we can wait a minute or two. Uh, well, now that it's 531, I, I think um, they would have been able to access it uh, by now. Okay. All right. Well, still seeing no attendees, I think um, we'll go ahead and adjourn to closed session. So I'll see you guys on the other side.
Do we still have people trying to join us, Holly? We um, have seven attendees right now. And um, oh, I see what you're talking. You're talking about our, our people. No, I everybody is here. Everybody's here that should be here. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, if that's the case, um, then I will go ahead and convene this open session meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley uh, Water District um, Board of Directors for April 21st, 2022. Um, there are no, there were no actions taken during closed session. Um, so we will now uh, convene the open session. Holly, would you take the roll? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackerman. Here. Director Fulz. Here. And Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda tonight? Staff has none, sure. Okay. Uh, that brings us to oral communications from members of the public on any subject that lies within the purview of the district but is not on the agenda tonight. Um, would any members of the public like to address the board? If so, please raise your hand. Okay. Not seeing anybody. Um, I will go ahead and go to uh, the president's report. And in reading the um, engineering and environmental report, I was really pleased when I saw the number of grants that the district has received um, of late. And this represents a major change in the district's stance with respect to outside funding. We're being much more aggressive in pursuing grants than we have in the past. And I thought the public would like to know about the successes that we've had. And I also want to um, recognize and applaud the work of the management staff and our grant writer in putting together these proposals. And to that end, I've asked Carly to briefly describe our recent grant successes and in particular, a large proposal that she recently completed and uh, with other staff involvement and submitted. So Carly. Thank you, President Mayhood. So as you mentioned, I'd like to really thank our consultant grant writer, Susan Robinson, who really helped us through and helped us clean up the narrative for a lot of our grant applications, um, as well as our staff. A lot of our management staff spent a good amount of time on this as well, um, helping me answer a lot of questions and get those narratives straight. Um, but since 2020, we've been awarded about $4.5 million in grant funding. Um, and this year alone, we will be pursuing about $11 million of funding. Um, so I can go through in my uh, environmental department status report, there is the grant tracking table um, that everyone can follow along with. And I can also share my screen if that's preferred. But just to highlight some of the few, let's see what I'm trying to share. The few applications that we have just submitted, um, we did submit a CAL FIRE fire prevention grant to harden our critical water infrastructure at about $1.5 million. Um, the large application that we just submitted to the Cal OES Hazard Mitigation Grant Program was for about $8 million, and that included retrofitting of redwood and poly tanks, hardening of pump houses, hardening supply lines, and fuel reduction around infrastructure. Um, we're currently working on the Water Smart Small Scale Water Efficiency Grant, which is about $100,000 in grant funding um, to allow us to continue the retrofitting of our meters um, to AMI meters. Uh, in the future, we may go after the larger grant program through the Bureau of Reclamation. It's also a Water Smart program. Uh, that would be an additional $250,000 for retrofitting of water meters. We also uh, have submitted an application for our Fall Creek Fish Ladder construction through the Prop 1 grant funding with CDFW or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and that was about a million dollars of funding that we're going after there. And then we have a, another application going out to the Coastal Conservancy's Wildfire Resilience Grant Program. We did receive awards 
last year for that program. So we're hoping that'll happen again. And this year we're targeting a bit, a bit more money at $300,000. Okay, well, thank you, Carly. It's a very impressive list. And um, again, I just wanna thank all the staff um, for putting all this effort in and really helping out the district and addressing um, the challenges of the drought and recovering from the fire. Um, with that, we'll go to new business. Um, the first order of business is a review of applications for the board vacancy. There's somebody's, um, I'm, I don't know if anybody else is hearing it, but I'm hearing somebody's um, echoing or something. I don't know, maybe if people can mute if they're not talking, um, that would be good. Um, and then we'll try to figure out what, what's causing it. All right. Um, the applicants were informed of the process in advance of tonight's meeting. That is that each applicant would be given up to three minutes to introduce themselves. And then as board president, I will ask them sequentially to answer in one minute or less, three questions. And given that this isn't a pop quiz, uh, they were told in advance what those three questions will be. Yesterday afternoon, we received an email from one applicant, Elizabeth Paulson, saying she couldn't attend the meeting tonight because of a previous commitment, but that she is still very interested and wanted to be considered. She included uh, an introduction and answers to the three questions, which were distributed to the members of the board uh, before the meeting this afternoon and have been posted to the website. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, start with uh, introductions from the two folks that are here tonight, Jeff Hill and Alina Lang. And Jeff, would you like to go ahead and start off? Okay, you have to unmute yourself now. <laughs> All right. Nothing like technology. Uh, so nice to see you all. Good evening. My name is Jeff Hill. And a couple of quick notes uh, to start with. Uh, for clarity's sake, I am not the Jeff Hill that owns a construction and grading business in the San Lorenzo Valley, and I don't do septic tanks. I'm the retired computer guy. <coughs> So I've been drinking San Lorenzo Valley water for 34 years now. I live in the far southern end of the SLV district uh, in the Whispering Pines neighborhood in Scotts Valley. Um, I understand there's not been a director from that area for many, many years. Uh, I'm married to my lovely wife, Karen, for 50, almost 51 years. I have two adult sons with uh, families who live in Seattle and Denver. Uh, the view behind my face here on my screen is uh, the view from my son's uh, vacation home in Index, Washington, looking out his front porch. I retired from full-time work in 2011, keep busy with lots of volunteer activities. I spent two years on the County Sheriff's Citizen Advisory Board, approximately two years on the City of Scotts Valley's General Plan Update Committee. Um, over five years as treasurer of the Michigan State University Alumni Club for the Monterey Bay area. And for the past seven years, uh, treasurer of the Scotts Valley Sportsman's Club, which is a club of a thousand members from around the area that owns a shooting range. I'm also the lead board member for environmental issues for the club's uh, leasehold property in the city of Scotts Valley. I have a bachelor's degree from the College of Communication Arts and Sciences at Michigan State and a Master of Business Administration degree from the Leeds Graduate School of Business at the University of Colorado. I was a Boy Scout leader for 10 years in Scotts Valley. Both my sons are Eagle Scouts. That was a lot of fun. I'm a veteran of the US Army and uh, was cited for outstanding meritorious service in 1971. Let's see. Um, as a youth and young adult, I spent a lot of time in Northern Wisconsin in the woods. Uh, I am familiar with woods and wildlife, and if there's one thing that San Lorenzo Valley has, it's lots of woods and wildlife. So uh, while the trees are different from Wisconsin, uh, I know what it's like to be in the woods, and I know what it's like to be around wildlife. And I care a lot about that, and I know that that's a, a major issue 
when you're talking about uh, water districts and piping and uh, having all kinds of things running through the woods. So, so I guess that's who I am. Um, I'm looking forward to this opportunity. And I've been on the finance committee now for almost two years, I guess a year and a half, and I've really enjoyed it. So uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. All right. We'll go ahead and let Alina uh, introduce herself, and then we'll go to the questions, and then we'll let the board ask any questions that they might have. Okay, Alina? All right. Well, hi, my name is uh, Alina Ling, and I'm a biologist. I was originally asked to come down here to California to apply my ex expertise in passive integrated transponder technology to help better understand how drought conditions affect salmonid migration. Now, having the ability to monitor fish migration and behaviors is critical to understanding the impacts of extreme client conditions, water operations, and developing management strategies to minimize those threats. You know, I've been a public servant my entire career, whether it be representing the federal or state government, collecting critical data, or participating in non-proprietary research to create new open source technological advancements. I fostered relationships with NGOs, private landowners, as well as local and federal agencies to allow site access and build partnerships among agencies. I also saw the impact of the, the previous fire before the CZU fire on the water quality and how it affected the salmonid rearing at the Scott Creek hatchery. I've been involved in many things in our area, including the installation of monitoring equipment on the Felton Bladder, Bladder Dam and conducting topographic land surveys for the Carmel Dam Removal Geomorphological Study. Now, besides my scientific expertise, I care deeply about the affordability of clean drinking water and addressing the equity of water in the era of rising costs. You know, I've shown this by attending other committee meetings to express my concern about owner-only accounts and how it would impact the low-income rate assistance program. My commitment to ratepayers is to evaluate every issue in a fair manner by considering all the facts and science behind them. I strive to strike a balance between our ecosystem and the water needs of our customers. You know, I've taken the oath several times in my career to protect and enhance our eco ecosystems uh, for present and future generations. And I would be honored to take the oath to provide reliable, clean, and high quality drinking water at equitable prices for the San Lorenzo Valley customers and future generations. Thank you, Alina. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the questions. Um, the first one is, please describe what particular skills or perspectives you would bring to the board and why those are important or useful. We'll start with you on this one with Jeff. Okay, so um, as you know, I've been on the finance committee now for about a year and a half. I understand budgets and I understand the important differences between accrual accounting and actual cash flow and how important that is for the, the uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District because we have a lot of projects where we get repaid by grants and the grants may not come in for a long time after we accrue the expenses. And so uh, that's something I'm quite familiar with. Um, I also am quite familiar with the differences between top-down forecasting and bottom-up budgeting and when it's appropriate to do which. Um, I care deeply about our community. Um, I'm well aware that we have many people in the community that uh, may not be able to afford water uh, easily. And so I am very sensitive to the fact that while we have people in the community that are are quite wealthy. We also have people who are quite poor and we need to keep our costs down and we need to provide water to them. I have successfully managed multiple complex product launches and business transformations. I've always tried to turn complexity into simplicity wherever possible. Sometimes things are just complex and the board and the district is facing an awful lot of complexity over the next year or two, actually the next probably four or five years. Uh, sometimes there's just a whole lot of detail to take care of. This is an area I'm really good at. Uh, I'm very good at dealing with large complex projects, product launches, um, working hand in glove between business management and engineering management. 
Um, that's an area of real strength for me. Uh, I was a product manager, a vice president of product management, director of product management for a number of tech firms and uh, conducted multiple successful product launches nationwide and internationally also. So um, okay. that's an area Thank I you. feel I have a strength in. I'll just repeat the question, Melina, so that people know what you're answering. <laughs> Please describe what particular skills or perspectives you would bring to the board and why those are important or useful. Go ahead. All right. Well, um, I have experience with National Marine Fisheries Service uh, permitting large water footway infrastructure, uh, where I was also the project manager in the field overseeing the installation. You know, I've hiked many of the streams in this area doing surveys for NIMPS and understand this flashy system very well um, through system installs, giving me a unique insight into what the limitations of this watershed are. You know, I have I also have a budget and finance experience with the federal government where I was tasked with allocating a project budgets on a firm fixed contracts to ensure research goals are met. And recently I became self-employed as a real estate investor. I got I've gone out to bid for projects, negotiated contracts, and budgeted finances, all to see substantial profit increase. I've also assisted um, in finding, uh, well, I guess one grant <laughs> that we went, that the district actually applied for, and uh, I actually helped write a letter of recommendation to help win that grant. And these skills translate well to the board by understanding the big picture of our watershed, the permitting process that goes along with the district's current construction projects, you know, limitations put forth with dealing with budgeting, the knowledge of, you know, how contracts are put to bid, you know, and the capability to find additional funding to not further burden our customers financially. Thank you. So we'll go to the second question, which is, given that this is a short-term appointment only until December, it would be valuable to have the new board member be ready to hit the ground running. Please describe what experience or involvement you've had with the district and or with leadership positions with similar board. So this time we'll let Alina go first. All right, well, I was appointed to the San Lorenzo Valley Water District's Environmental Committee in 2021, and then I was reappointed for the 2022 year for the now combined Engineering and Environmental Committee. I've shown my dedication by attending every meeting, and most cases, a quorum would not have been reached in my absence. Out of the candidates today, um, I have the most knowledge of the inner workings of the districts from being involved in all all the ongoing engineering and environmental projects. And you can't talk about these projects without bringing up the budget and financial aspect of them. So it also makes me knowledgeable about the district's finances. And in addition, like I've attended other committee meetings, um, and keep up on their agendas. I also stay current on the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, attending Cal Fire briefings and other relevant conferences. Um, I really feel that like Tina too should have been replaced by another scientist as that's what the community said with their votes. Now that we're left with an administration board member heading the environmental committee, I think it makes logical sense to elect a scientist like me to round out the board and sit on the environmental and engineering committee and then move the administration board member to the proper committee. And I'm, I'm confident that I can jump onto this short-term appointment without skipping a beat. Thank you, Lena. Jeff? So, uh, like Helena, uh, I'm a year and a half into committee membership for the uh, district. I'm on the finance committee, and um, Lois Henry, who uh, has resigned and uh, finally fully retired, I guess, um, was the chairman of the finance committee, so that is where we have a current vacancy also. Um, I'm quite familiar with the district's budget, the sources of funds, the use of funds uh, uh, is sort of the, the flip side of what Alina was saying. Uh, she knows the budget from looking at the engineering projects. I know the engineering projects from looking at the budget uh, in that sense. And uh, there's a whole lot of uh, issues that I think need to be dealt with from a financial point of view, and I'm pretty well qualified to deal with those. And, uh, I have the time, I'm, I'm available to do it, and I'm interested and eager. So there's what we have. Thank you. 
And the final question is, what do you consider the major challenges to the district in the next year or two? And this time we'll let Jeff go first. Okay. So when I look at the district, the district, it, it's not business as usual for the next few years. The district is dealing with a set of complex simultaneous projects that require a lot of engineering product management experience, staffing, uh, public relations, customer relations, and finance management. You've got the CZU fire rebuild, the mergers with Forest Lake, Rackham Bray, and Big Basin, the already existing long list of uh, complex pro uh, engineering upgrades and replacement product uh, projects uh, across the district. Um, one of the major problems with all of this is also going to be cash flow because with cash flow, uh, so many of these projects are projects that we have to do something and then get reimbursed for it. And so we're gonna have to watch cash flow very, very carefully while we manage all these projects so that we don't find ourselves with bills to pay and uh, grants that haven't come in yet or you know, money that hasn't been uh, paid back to us by the uh, grantor. So I, I think if I'm looking at the biggest pro problem here, it's complexity and financial management as we try to work our way through all of this long list of, of uh, engineering and construction projects and recovery projects. Okay, thank you. Alina. All right, well, but I think he summarized about all of, all of the issues we have going on. But I think that priority number one is uh, getting the surface water intake systems replaced after the CZU fire and being able to utilize uh, surface water during wet durations of the year and allowing our wells to rest and recharge our groundwater is essential to the long term health of the watershed. Groundwater is important because it contributes to the base flow of almost all the streams in the basin, which is particularly important in the summer and fall months when there's a lack of rainfall. Without these base flows, it's not possible to support aquatic inhabitants or, or watershed in, in a, <clears throat> of our watershed, and it also impacts our downstream water users. Oh, and another really important task that I think is important is bringing positivity and cooperation between board members, district employees, and committee members. We've seen a decline in participation in the committees, and it's very apparent. There's been a lot of harsh words spoken during the environmental committees directed at staff and community volunteers. I'm, I'm kind of over <laughs> the aggression that's coming at me during a volunteer job, and I believe that's why a lot of others have dropped out. You know, community volunteers to feel like they're being heard and contributing to the community, you know, not just checking a box. During an environmental committee meeting, a board member asks, are we here to protect the environment or provide people with water? And the answer is always both. The water district is obligated under Article 10, Section 2 of the California Constitution to protect the beneficial use of water. And we need board members that understand that. The voters deserve a board member that recognizes the envir em environmental impacts of water use and infrastructure. And our future should be in the hands of those who be around to experience the impacts that this board will make. We cannot continue to provide clean drinking water without also protecting our environment. Thank you. Well, I don't know how other people respond, but I, I've just been really impressed by the thoughtfulness of both of your answers. And I, Thank you for your willingness to serve and for thinking about these things beforehand so that you can give the answers that you did uh, tonight. So let me just go and see if there's any members of the board that would like to ask you questions um, before we begin our discussion. Mark. Yes. Um, Jeff. <clears throat> Given your current uh, work with the Sportsman's Club, what is your availability for board roles, committee roles? Um, um, well, first of all, I retired. The Sportsman's Club takes maybe 20% of my time, something like that, mm -hmm. um, maybe 25%. Um, I'm in the process of resigning from being the treasurer of the Michigan State Alumni Club after, you know, quite a few years of doing that. 
Um, but basically, I have I have plenty of time available. Okay. Thank you. And I do have one question for Alina also. Uh, Alina, uh, in your uh, presentation just a few minutes ago, you expressed uh, the interest in being on uh, being the board representative on the now combined engineering and environmental committee. Um, if that's not the uh, the need or the uh, identified uh, role that we need a board member to fill, and you were the one who is uh, seated, how do you feel about being involved in one of the other committees instead? Oh, I mean, and that's fine is it with me as well. I mean, I always like learning new things and expanding my knowledge. So, and giving me more insight into the district besides just my expertise. So I think that would be a wonderful opportunity as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from members of the board? Jamie. Um, so first, I want to thank you both for um, for being here tonight and being so thoughtful in your um, responses to us. Um, and and you know, I really appreciate everyone who um, applied for the role. But you know, I I, I think that you know, in, in a situation like this, um, being here to answer our questions and get to know each other when we're appointing a board member is incredibly important. So thank you for um, participating in the process. Um, the I, I want to sort of ask both of you, um, because you are are both really, in my view, um, very equal candidates in, in your um, involvement with the Water District and, you know, your, your, you know, commitment to our local community over the years. Um, but you all, you both uh, probably come from you know some differing perspectives as well. So I'm I'm interested um, you know if both of you could answer this question from your own perspective about how um, you will uh, you know from your your background um, either in in finance and and technology, Jeff, or your your background in environmental concerns, um, Alina to um, sort of set aside some of, you know, your, your own personal um, focus and passion and, and recognize as a board member that you are, are you know, playing a role here um, that has to balance the needs of a district, an agency, employees, our commitments to them with our commitments to the community, our partner agencies, and of course, our regulatory agencies. Um, if you could just sort of talk a little bit about your, you know, your views on how you can Sort of best serve the agency from your own background um, as we navigate some of those issues. That would be helpful for me. Jeff, I'll I'll ask you to go first, just because I I you see you both not jumping. <laughs> I, I I get it. Um, do you We're need scratching to our head. I'm asking. I think that was addressed first to Alina. At least that was the way I read it. So why don't you go ahead and uh, respond? Sure, either one, one, whichever one feels comfortable <laughs> answering first. Um, oh, well, I mean, I have uh, a lot of experience, you know, playing whatever role it is that I've been hired to do, whether that's, you know, being with the state or federal government and your personal beliefs don't really come into play with those types of positions. You're there, you know, to support your local government or federal government and um, the, the, the task at hand. And I understand that the board is, you know, very similar to that. Um, and I've also, you talked about like working with the regulatory agencies and all of that. And I do have experience with that, you know, having to come together and form partnerships that sometimes are, uh, not um, always likely or that people butt heads and, and trying to come uh, to a common ground to accomplish these projects that I've been assigned to. Um, so I my, my, I'm not, I don't want to come off as like I'm some crazy environmentalist that's going to push my agenda because, you know, that's not me. I want what's best for the water district, what's best for our consumers, and also taking into consideration and what's best for our environment. And I think that all plays into the goals of the water district. Uh, 
Thanks, Alina. That was excellent. Um, Jeff, did you want to did you want to take a crack at your thoughts? Yeah, let's let me just pull my thoughts together here for a second. Uh, after such a nice uh, response from Alina, I have to stop and think for a second. Um, so, you know, different constituencies that we have to deal with. Uh, we have to deal with the public. We have to deal with the ratepayers. We have to deal with employees. Um, we have to deal with government agencies. I've had a fair amount of experience with, with pretty much all of these. Um, in business, I employed people and I worked with other departments and coordinated things. Um, I recall one time when I was sent to um, the UK uh, to, with several of our engineers uh, to meet with our engineering team there. Uh, the reason I was sent was I was to be Switzerland. I had to negotiate between these groups uh, a rather difficult uh, compromise, and it was deemed that I was the one to do that. Um, employees, I, like I said, I've employed people, I've uh, hired them, I've unfortunately occasionally fired them. Um, most of my former employees I'm still in touch with, people I haven't seen in 20 years. I still keep in touch with them on Facebook. They ask me questions. Um, I do a lot of thinking about how to be good with employees. And that's a, an area I've, I've had a strength in and haven't had a lot of experience within the last few years because I haven't had any employees, but it's an area when I was working, I was very good in. Um, governmental regulations. Um, well, I spent a lot of time with governmental regulations in the army. Um, but recently with the sportsman's club, uh, shooting ranges have issues with environmental issues, um, and regulations. And I've spent a lot of time bringing myself up to speed and, and working with, uh, within the boundaries of the various environmental regulations. Um, and, you know, basically, as I said, I grew up kind of spending all my summers in Wisconsin in the woods. And so I have a real passion for wild territory with woods and streams and lakes and things like that. And uh, I also got a real firsthand knowledge of how everything interacts in the woods and, you know, uh, the relationship between the different as aspects of what you find. And there are redwood trees up there, but, uh, you know, woods are woods and it's, it's something I feel deeply about. So, um, I'm not quite sure where, where to go beyond that and answering your question because your question was kind of long and kind of covered a number of areas. So uh, if you want me to highlight anything, please let me know. I appreciate that. Thank you for the very thoughtful answer. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from members of the board before we go to a discussion? Bob? No? Okay. All right. Um, I think what we'll do then is we will um, discuss among the board and then we'll also go out for uh, comments by the public. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a, a motion uh, from somebody on, on the board uh, on terms of what um, to do. So if we could start the discussion with Jamie. Um, well, I, I appreciate, um, like I said, uh, the high quality of the candidates that we have to choose from. That's a high class, you know, problem to have, um, to have two such great candidates. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in my view, um, what we're replacing is the function that we, we, you know, lost in terms of the role that Lois played on the board. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, have some uh, particular concerns around um, how we are, uh, you know, proceeding um, with our uh, capital and um, uh, construction outreach. And um, so I'm, I'm really interested in making sure that whomever we select um, is going to, you know, help to be a, a good advocate for the water district as we sort of navigate these really challenging next year or so in terms of community outreach around 
um, some really sensitive environmental issues that we're looking at related to capital projects, but also financial and budgetary issues. So those are the, the um, considerations that I'm weighing as I look at both of these candidates. Bob? Yeah, I, I would echo uh, a lot of what uh, Jamie said. You know, I think the three candidates, um, you know, anybody that puts their name into um, the hat, so to speak, for these roles is really taking on a very serious obligation with the community. And it's really great to see that, that people step up and do that. Um, I, from my point of view, I, I would encourage Elizabeth to um, perhaps get involved in one of the committees will, I think, have at least one vacancy, depending on which of the other two candidates are selected, and get to know the district a little bit more. I think she has some background that um, has some applicability to the, the district and its functions, um, but I think both Jeff and Alina bring uh, a depth of experience, time with the district, and particular skills um, that uh, would be good. In some ways, it would be nice if we could kind of, you know, put them into one person and that would bring them everything together into one. Um, so it will be a very, very difficult choice. Um, and I think I am um, would like to hear what, uh, what Mark and Gail have to say as well. Thank you. Mark? Yes. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last uh, year and a half uh, in leading the Engineering and Environmental Committee to participate with Alina, um, and I've appreciated her comments and views um, in those meetings, and the fact that she um, has been a committee participant there. I also appreciate the fact that Jeff has been involved for a similar year and a half with the Budget and Finance Committee. Um, so we have two candidates here in front of us uh, that are obviously interested in the board and interested in a successful operation of the district. I think that's great. Uh, one question that I wasn't able to ask, and it was to Elizabeth, was, so what is your awareness of involvement with the district? Because I didn't see that in her application. We did see it with both of these two candidates and in their answers that they presented to us. Um, very thoughtful, slightly different perspectives, but I think that's good uh, that we have different perspectives out there. So I'm pleased that we have a uh, somewhat difficult uh, choice in front of us. Good. Thank you both for being here. I'll turn it back to you, Gil. All right. Um, I, I guess I would echo what Bob said um, to Elizabeth that we encourage you to uh, serve on a committee. And in fact, I would say that Bob said that to me a couple of years ago, and look what happened. <laughs> when I applied for one of these open positions, I, I was not chosen, but Bob suggested that I serve on a committee, and I did. And gosh, what happened next? So I, I would encourage Elizabeth to, to do that. But I think that, as Mark says, that, that um, we really want somebody that has the level of engagement that both Jeff and Alina have, um, because we need somebody that can hit the ground running, um, both mm -hmm. given the challenges that are facing the district uh, and um, given that this is a short-term um, situation. I will say that I favor Jeff Hill for this position. Um, largely because I have found his participation in uh, the Budget and Finance Committee to be both sub substantial and substantive and helpful. Um, he will make an excellent replacement um, for Lois on this committee. And um, I, I think that the financial aspects and um, experience with dealing with staff, I mean, one of the, the the great challenges that we have, given that um, one of the major costs in our budget is staff, is understanding um, how you deal with that is, is a, in my view, a, a, a real positive. And I realize this, this is just uh, my, my judgment on this, and other people can take another approach to this, and I would respect that as, as well. Um, 
I also think of the three applicants, Jeff has the most experience serving on boards and commissions and advisory groups, which means that he will grasp readily um, how boards um, operate. And finally, I think it would be great to have somebody from Scotts Valley, which we haven't um, had on the board for decades. Um, so with that, um, I would like, unless the members of the board want to say something before I go out to the public, well, I will come back and ask for more comments from the board. Is that okay? So I, I will go out to members of the public and gosh, we've got, we've got quite a number of people attending. 13, um, would anybody like to make a comment or ask a question? Uh, okay, we'll start with Katie. Can we um, allow Katie to speak, please? Holly, can you um, raise the CTV folk? <laughs> Holly, you're you're muted, so I can't hear you. Cedric, if you can hear me, can we please um, ask Katie or mute, unmute Katie? So there, oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, Katie, you're uh, you're up. Hello, this is Katie from Boulder Creek. Um, I voted for Tina Toe, and I find it frankly appalling that her vacancy was filled by someone without a scientific background. Uh, I really don't understand the logic of not having at least one biologist on the water district board. And given her background and experience, it seems pretty clear that Alina Lang is the obvious choice and we, the constituents, would be lucky to have her working for us and with us. And that is what I have to say. Okay, thank you, thank you Katie. Uh, Jim Mosher. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, and I, uh, Jim Mosier from Felton. Um, I am really pleased that we have three candidates here who have applied, and I think all three would be great assets to the board. I, um, but I would like to say that I think Jeff Hill would be my choice because of his expertise with budgets, the work he's done on the budget committee and his long experience, I think he has the resources, he has the knowledge and the experience that would be most useful for us at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Any uh, other? Uh, Elaine Fresco. Go ahead, Elaine. Okay, uh, hi, this is Elaine Fresco from Felton. And I, I just wanna start out by saying, uh, as you all have said, how impressed I am with both Jeff and Alina, uh, because both of you have excellent resumes and very relevant experience. Um, I like Alina's uh, environmental background and her commitment to clean water. And I like Jeff's ability to deal with complicated projects and budget issues. So I'm thinking that right now, because of the immediate challenges facing the district, the budget issues and the projects uh, are take precedence. But I would like to say, so I would favor Jeff, but I would like to say to Alina, I will support your candidacy if you decide to run for office. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Larry Ford. Thank you very much. This is Larry Ford from Felton. I, I really appreciate everything that I've heard tonight. I, I just have to say that um, I'm so impressed with anybody who's willing to serve on the board of directors of the Water District. It's a lot of work. It's challenging. It uh, means that you have to face criticism sometimes that's completely irrational. And I think I would have a hard time doing that. I would I would get mad. Is that what anyway, uh, 
So I'm really impressed that you all are willing to serve, and I'm impressed that you're you, the two candidates that I'm now more familiar with are um, are still willing to serve. Um, this is a temporary position, and uh, so I don't know whether you're willing to run for election in November. I think you would, both of you would be electable if you were running in November, and I would support both of you also. Um, I wish okay. we'd had a chance to support Elizabeth. Anyway, um, this is very difficult to choose among the, you know, between the two of you who we've heard from. But I think I would have to agree that at this point, I'd like to see Jeff nominated and elected to be uh, to fill in for for Lois Henry. And uh, Alina, you're a really close second, and I'm sorry that I can't give you my endorsement right now at this time. Thank you. Over. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Um, can we get the, the people that are talking um, that to mute? Because Elaine, we're 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 creeping into your uh, personal life there. <laughs> not it's not your fault. You just didn't get turned off afterwards. So let's make sure that the talking permitted is only uh, with the person that is uh, that I've called on. So are there any other uh, members that would like to? Uh, uh, members of the public, Lee. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think I think all of you have a really difficult uh, choice because these are the two people that are present at the meeting. Uh, they're both really excellent candidates, and I agree with what people have said before that both should should uh, um, run in, in the next election. Um, what I'm kind of looking at though is that over the past several years. The environmental committee has been reduced quite a bit, and um, I know that Carly does an excellent job, but she's juggling a lot of things. And to have an extra person on the board that has that environmental, um, such a stellar environmental background like Elena does, um, that would um, help fill in some of the the gaps that that has been missing over the past you know few years. Um, and so I, I would uh, recommend that she be uh, nominated. For the position, um, although they're both excellent position, uh, excellent choices. So, but that's my leaning. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Uh, would any other members of the public like to speak at this time? Okay. Uh, I don't see. Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. Thank you. Did, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Did, um, okay, so I'm Elizabeth Zampona. I live in Boulder Creek, and I'm actually a neighbor of Alina. And um, I just cannot say enough about her as her as she's involved our our neighborhood and really gathered us together. Um, so I sh and then her scientific background, her environmental background, and considering what's going on in our world right now. I, I, I understand finance is very important, um, but I also think the environment is too. I think she is reasonable and is not going to go crazy, like losing in the finances. Anyway, I just, I, I vote for Alina. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from members of the public? Can we just ask um, Jim Lee? Jim and Lee to mute, please. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised out there. So I would like to uh, return uh, to the board um, for any other further um, discussion um, or if anybody would like to make a motion. Mark? Yes. Um, like I've heard from several members of the public, I feel that the financial aspects of the board that are in front of us right now are the critical or the most critical item out there. Um, given that, I'd like to nominate 
Jeff Hill or make a motion that Jeff Hill be appointed for the vacancy on the board. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. So we have a motion to appoint Jeff Hill um, and we will discuss that motion. Um, Bob, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to offer a few comments um, regarding roles of board members. Um, board members have to address a, a lot of different uh, topics, uh, ranging from operations, finance, administration, environmental, engineering, construction, what have you. Um, and no one person is going to have expertise in all of these things, which is why uh, it's really important that uh, board members be prepared and ready and um, look at this from a generalist point of view. That is, um, and really in that generalist role, uh, in, in my opinion, um, you have to combine that with oversight. And oversight comes with an inherent amount of skepticism and questioning and looking for ways to improve and change. Um, ultimately, though, the number one job of a board member are the finances. Um, that, that is the um, blood that makes the district run. And we have a lot of challenges facing our district right now with finances and how that relates to what we need to do. So um, I'm, I'm looking at both candidates from that lens, generalism, finances, skepticism, and um, th this is a really tough decision. You know, Alina, especially since when I look at your resume, um, you know, I see a lot of places my dad was in terms of when he was working on the dams in, in the Corps of Engineers. A little different focus back then, of course, in building them. And the time you spent on the Oregon coast, about uh, 30 miles south of where I grew up. So um, I understand that kind of situation very, very much. And it's, um, it's good that you're going to uh, continue with the district one way or the other and providing your viewpoint to help us make those kinds of decisions. Uh, any other comments or questions from the board? Okay, we do have a motion on the table. I would like to go now out to the public in case they want to comment on the motion. I don't see any hands raised out there. So with that, we'll come back. Um, and, uh, if, and if there's no further comments by members of the board, I will ask uh, Holly to take a roll call vote on the motion that's on the table, which is to appoint Jeff Hill um, to the vacancy as a member of the board of directors. Holly? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. The motion passes unanimously. Um, I, I believe that at this time we, uh, Bob, go ahead. I was gonna uh, ask if we could have like a five minute um, break while Jeff gets sworn in and that sort of thing. Uh, sure. Do you, uh, if everybody else, can you go ahead? Is that okay, Holly? Can you swear him in while the rest of the board goes off and takes a little uh, break? Yeah. Okay. I, so I, well, we will, I, we will I, wait, hold on just a moment. I would have to ask G, defer to Gina. Okay. 
Yeah, Chair May Hood, I, I, I would just recommend keeping with past precedent in terms of swearing him in with the board present, and then a okay. break could be taken either before or after okay. the swearing. All right, in. well, let, let's do this. Let's go ahead and swear him in, and then we'll take a five minute break. How's that, Bob? That'd be great. Then. Okay, all right, let's, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, Jeff, could I ask you to unmute yourself, please? And raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name, do solemnly swear or affirm. I, Jeffrey Hill, do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And to the Constitution of the State of California. And to the Constitution of the State of California. Take this obligation freely. I take this obligation freely without any mental, mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Welcome to the board. Thank you. Thank you all. And I see that Alyssa has apparently uh, departed the meeting, but I wanted to wish her well. I think she's just a panelist. I'll attendee, do, I mean, uh, an attendee now. Okay, I'll do it offline. Okay, let's go ahead and take a five minute uh, recess. Um, so we'll be back at 7.32, okay? Thank you.
Okay, looks like we're all back. Uh, let's see, where's is Rick back with us? There he is. Getting a snack. All right, but you're with us. That's the important thing. Okay, so I think with that, we can um, go on to the next item of business, um, which is the membership of the Budget and Finance Committee. And according to the board policy manual, the board president makes recommendations regarding board member committee assignments and submits those to the board for their approval. So um, I am recommending that Jeff Hill be appointed to the Budget and Finance Committee and that all other committee assignments remain uh, the same. So that's my recommendation. Is there any board uh, discussion of that recommendation? No? I would like to move your uh, recommendation um, and just say welcome, uh, Jeff Hill. I think uh, you will. You have already made a, an excellent contribution to the Budget and Finance Committee, and so look forward to you continuing to make an excellent contribution on the Budget and Finance Committee. Is there a second? I will second that. Okay. Uh, any comments by other members of the board on the motion? Seeing none, um, I'll go out to uh, the members of the public. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on the motion? Okay. Seeing none, um, we'll come back. And Holly, could you take a roll call vote on the motion that uh, Jeff Hill be appointed to the Budget and Finance Committee and that all other committee assignments remain as they are? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Director Hill? Jeff, are you having trouble unmuting? I'm sorry, yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes to the motion or yes, you were having trouble? <laughs> yes to the motion. Thank you. All right, um, the motion passes unanimously. That brings us to the next item on the uh, agenda, which is the fiscal year 20. 223 budget review and adjustment. Rick? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, the district's finance manager will present this item to the board. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this item is in regards to the preliminary fiscal year 22 23 uh, proposed budget adjustments. In fiscal year 21 22, the board of directors adopted the first biennial budget. Uh, district staff does a budget review annually, comparing budget to actuals and estimated actuals. Since there have been a lot of changes in talks from the board about possibly amending the budget for fiscal year 22-23, the following outlines the proposed budget adjustments to the fiscal year 22-23 adopted budget. Uh, so we'll start with operating revenue. The basics were doing a slight adjustment to the basic charge, um, decreasing it by $2,400, this adjustment. Excuse me, Kendra, do you wanna share your screen to do this or? Um... Um, I'm actually logged in via Zoom on my iPad. So I would have to bring it up real quick. Um, or could, could Holly, could you share your screen and bring it up with the agenda? I, I might, might if Holly's keeping the minutes, um, it might be distracting for her to scroll through. I could. Um, okay, yeah, how about district council then Holly make her a presenter? Okay. It looks like that would I be, have, okay. It looks like I have the button, um, if you'll bear with me. Here. 
Perfect. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Gina. Um, so the, the water basic charge, a uh, slight adjustment of a decrease of $2,400. This adjustment is to account for the CZU home rebuilds. Uh, it was originally budgeted that 100 homes would be reconnected by December 2022. Uh, we're now only projecting that 75 homes will be. Excuse me. By yeah. we're, we're, not, we're not seeing it on the screen. Sorry. We're seeing, Gina, we're seeing a, a, a meeting invite. Okay, sorry about that. Hold on just a second. You did have it for a second. Yeah, we had it for a moment and then it went away. Hmm. Are you seeing it now? Yes. 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 Okay, let me make sure I can scroll and it isn't going to toggle to something else again. I'm, I'm, do you see it moving? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Fultz. Um, okay, so uh, we are now only projecting that 75 homes will be reconnected by December, 2022. So that's that slight adjustment. Um, water usage, this adjustment is to account for the decrease in consumption we have seen in fiscal year 21-22. Um, we are starting to see an increase in usage again in March 2022. Um, in the note, I am stating it's 18% higher than prior year, but it's actually, that's a typo, it's actually 21% higher than prior year. Um, and this is attributed to the warmer weather. Overall, though, since fiscal year 21-22 has seen a decrease, we are just seeing fiscal year 22-23's usage um, by negative 3%. So that's about a $281,000 difference. Um, in operating grants, uh, this is actually going to change. This is for the Coastal Conservancy grant we were awarded. Uh, all of the work is expected to be completed prior to June 30th, 2022. And we will invoice all of the work in fiscal year 21, 22. Um, so that's when the revenue will be recognized then. So this, I actually need to make an adjustment to, I apologize for that. Um, we will be recognizing this revenue in the current fiscal year we are in. So there will not be a adjustment for the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Um, as Carly mentioned earlier in the meeting, we will be applying for the Coastal Conservancy grant again, but it just has not been awarded yet for this, obviously for this upcoming fiscal year. Um, so those are the operating revenue adjustments. We will move on to operating expenses. Um, and then in this, I'll just go through each department and each category and kind of explain the main adjustments that we are proposing. <clears throat> so for department 100, the salaries and benefits is a decrease of 88,000. This adjustment is the difference between the budgeted position assumptions and a potential in-house promotion. It also includes splitting that said promotion um, of the new administrative analyst position 50-50 between department 100 and department 500, um, and then also updated the benefit costs. In contract professional services, it's an increase of 289,000. 100,000 is for the rate study that did not occur in fiscal year 21-22. 139,000 is for the Santa Margarita groundwater expenses. And not yet approved by the board, but wanted to note this in here, is an additional 15,000 for outreach. Uh, the admin committee voted to request the board to, to approve a budget increase for outreach to 50,000. Um, and then advertising is an increase of 25,000, and this is for recruitment of the water quality and treatment manager position. In department 200 salary, salaries and benefits, this is decreased by about 145,000. This adjustment is the difference between the budgeted position and the promotion of the director of finance. 
uh, not yet approved is a um, adjustment to hire a temporary finance position from a temp agency of about 85,000 and uh, updated benefit costs. In the contract professional services, it's an increase of 2,500. This is to move to uh, paychecks, electronic timekeeping and time off system. Department 300 in engineering, uh, salaries and benefits increase of 98,000. This includes an adjustment for the difference between a budgeted GIS CAD specialist and the new hire. Uh, not yet approved is also adding a construction inspector position. This position is being reviewed by the E&E committee before going to the board for approval. And, and this is also um, updating the benefit costs. Contract professional services was a decrease of 10,000. Um, initially had that in for the master plan, but since it's now completed, we will not be incurring any more expenses for that. Operating expenses is an increase of 1,500 for a new laptop for the construction inspector if approved by the board. Um, same with a cell phone for the construction inspector. And then gen general and admin is an increase of 500 for um, miscellaneous trainings. Moving on to department 400, operations and distribution. The salaries and benefits is a decrease of 99,000. Uh, this adjustment is the difference between what was budgeted for the field services worker and a new hire. We uh, decreased overtime wages by 15,000 and budgeted or updated the benefit costs. Uh, operating expenses was a decrease of 20,000 for miscellaneous items. Department 500, in salaries and benefits increase of 38,000. Um, this is for the in-house promotion I was talking about earlier in splitting the department 100 and 500 allocation 50-50. Not yet approved would be um, filling the environmental specialist position and also updated the benefit costs. Contract professional services is an increase of 29,000, 35,000 being for grant writing services that was not originally budgeted for and offset by a decrease of 6,000 in uh, various other services and uh, an increase of 500 for a district cell phone. Department 800, supply and treatment, salaries and benefits is a decrease of 326,000. This adjustment is the difference between the budgeted water treatment operator um, who retired and a new hire. Also, um, adjustment for an estimated six month vacancy to fill the water quality and treatment manager position. We decreased overtime by 20,000 and updated the be benefit costs. Contract professional services was a decrease of 10,000 for miscellaneous items and operating expenses was a decrease of 5,000. Um, department 600 sewer funds, the operating supplies was a decrease of 2,000 and facilities a decrease of 2,500. So overall operating expense adjustment is a decrease of 209,000 or uh, 2. negative 2.3 percent to the adoption fiscal year 22-23 budget. Um, this adjustment includes the potential new hires and outreach increase that have not been not yet been approved by the board. Um, if those positions were to not be approved by the board, the overall expense operating expense adjustment is a decrease of 529,000 or about six, negative six percent to the adopted budget. Moving on to capital expenditures, um, the fiscal year 21 through 23 adopted CI budget, CIP budget had 20.7 million and 13.3 million for fiscal year 21, 22 and fiscal year 22, 23 respectively. Uh, the budget or the CIP budget adjustments are as follows. Fiscal year 21, 22, we, bud we had a budget request of 20.7 million. The estimated actuals for fiscal year 21-22 are 4.3 million. This is primarily due to design and consultant construction material delays on some of our larger projects. 
the fiscal year 22-23 budget request is 13.3 million. Um, the budget adjustment is 28.3 million. The significant increase in the budget adjustment is obviously attributed to the delays that occurred in fiscal year 21-22. Um, pushing all of the projects into this next fiscal year. Uh, so recently, I think this was discussed at our last board meeting, was FEMA increased their cost share percentage from 75% to 90%. And the state cost share percentage that was not originally included in the budget for fiscal year 22-23 is 7.5%. Uh, so our inflows from capital contributions is being adjusted from 4.2 to 8.1 million. Um, and then the adjustment for the estimated physical cash inflow for when we expect to receive those reimburses is as follows. Um, fiscal year 22-23 budget was 8.4. We're adjusting that to the 6.3. Um, which brings us into non-operating revenue. Um, I'll skip down to FEMA reimbursements. So these these reimbursements are based on a cash cash basis for when we when the reimbursement will be received. Um, this is this adjustment is to account for the processing time it takes FEMA to review and approve and send out funding. Initially, we're expecting to receive funding a lot sooner, but with their limited labor labor resources, it has been extremely delayed. We have reached out to FEMA and are working with them to see if we can draw down on projects that have not been completed so we can receive funding for those projects sooner. Um, so that's something that's in the works. Uh, capital grants, the fiscal year 22-23 budget was zero. The adjustment is the three million for to account for the grant that was awarded for the Bracken Bray Forest Springs consolidation. Um, and then non-operating expense, there was no real change there. Um, so that concludes the preliminary review of the proposed adjustments for fiscal year 22-23. Does anyone have questions? Well, as, as a chair of that committee, I just want to start out by congratulating you um, and uh, all of the managerial staff of really combing through the budget and finding ways to save money on um, expenses and on staff salaries. And I, I think that is really to, <laughs> to be commended. And the fact that you ended up with an operating budget that was less uh, than the one we had before, even though we had to absorb that 137000 for administrative, our, our share of administrative costs for Santa Margarita, which we had not budgeted previously, um, is, you know, is to your credit. So thank you um, to you and the rest of the staff for, for doing that. Um, Jeff, you're the other uh, board member that's on that committee. Did, did you have any comments or questions? Um. I really, at this point, only have one question, and this is under capital expenditures, where we went from thirteen million three hundred four thousand to twenty eight million three hundred twelve thousand. Um, and this is really a question for Rick. Um, do we have the physical capacity, the manpower, et cetera, to get that much more work done? I, I don't know. You know, is this going to? That, that's a big jump. I, I, it is a big job and we have, uh, to answer your question, and um, we have uh, brought up our engineering staff to three. Uh, most of these projects will be uh, consulting, uh, hired out with consulting engineer firms, yes, but there will be oversight and review by not only the engineering staff, but the engineering and environmental committee. The short answer is yes, I believe so, we do. Okay. Take your word for that, but that was my big concern there because I looked at that and said that's a big jump, and uh, I know one of our issues is having enough people to get some of this work done. So 
Sure. And, you know, Jeff, is, as you get your settled in, we'd be more than happy, uh, in district engineer and myself, or even uh, the, uh, the engineer chair, would be more than happy to sit down and, and go through the process with you. I'd love to do that. Uh, yes. Real speed. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's go to the rest of the board. Let me start with Bob. Excuse me. Mark had his hand up, and I'm I'm in this mode here. Where I'm, I'm going to let Mark go first. Oh well, I I just kind of tend to go um, I, like I have please. my little thing that I go alphabetical. I, I, and Jamie started the first was first on the last issue, so you're ne you're up next. So I'm trying to be fair about who goes first. Oh, I see. I, but if you want to defer to somebody else, you may. Please no, no, <laughs> Bob, you're up. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I do want to, um, because, you know, last meeting, Mark, I, I, I think I got oh, ahead of you one time. Yeah. Um, yes, I do want to echo what uh, uh, Gail said about the, um, uh, the budget here. Um, you know, <clears throat> as I've said uh, many times, and probably will say again in the future, the rate of growth in operating expenses is really, in my opinion, one of the key areas for the district to focus on. And so anything we can do to continue um, reducing the, the rate of growth in expenses is really great. And I commend you, Kendra, uh, and all the senior management staff, I'm sure that we're involved in that for, for working hard to put that together. Um, I don't know if that's me in the background. There's nobody here, so it, it might be the mixer. Um, I did have a number of uh, point questions that I'd like to go through, um, starting with, uh, so headcount still at 35? Um, I think we're at 34 now, so yes, it would be 35 in fiscal year 22-23. Okay. On page 25, uh, Department 200, you mentioned a temporary finance position from a temp agency, is that a backfill for a vacancy? Uh, I will be on leave, so yes, that's the oh. attended. Oh. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Thanks yep. for clarifying. Yep. Um, on page 28 on the capital budgets, um, we're even with the significant increase from 75% coverage in the budget to, I guess, 97.5% now, um, we're seeing an increase in the in the budget um, to cover that. And the question I have is, is there still going to be enough in the not um, enough money in the $15 million 2021 loan to cover all of the non CZU projects that were on that list? Yeah, all of all of the fifteen million dollar loan projects will still have their funding allocated to them, like they initially were. Okay, if that answers your question. Uh, yes, just to okay. make sure that nothing had to fall off yet, because I know when we talked about it, when we approved it, there was a possibility, depending on how this shook out, that something may get dropped. So it's it's great news if nothing gets dropped. Um. Uh, on future reports like this, which are really great, I, I always like to just go for the operating margin number. So putting page 38, which is the summary at the as the first page, would, would be really helpful. On that slide, I noticed that if we back out the fire recovery surcharge from the operating income, we get down to a bit over $3 million. When I compare that against our current year-to-date numbers, which are in your budget and finance report later on, which is showing through February, we're at 1.2 million, again, excluding the uh, CZU surcharge. That, that means we'd have March, April, May, June, four months to make up um, 1.8 million in margin. It, is there a plan to do that? That is something I would need to look into further and get back to you on. Um, I don't have an answer for you on that tonight. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think it's going to be important if we're going to be doing these adjustments that um, everything get updated for the 
the, the actuals that we have, it looks like we're, we're working here from the budget to maybe just making the adjustments without having rolled in the actuals yet. Um, I, I'm skeptical we can make up that 1.8 million, but I really, really hope we do. And I'm hoping that, that you and Rick can show us how that, um, how that happened. Okay. Um, that, that was it. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned the uh, Coastal Conservancy grant at uh, 200000 and I saw that uh, as revenue, but didn't see an offsetting expense. Is that uh, related to what you said that that should have been allocated to uh, that uh, 21 22 budget instead yeah it, exactly um so this this is looking at fiscal year 22 23 adjustments right um and so it was found that all of those expenses are going to be incurred in um fiscal year 21-22, and we'll be receiving the revenue in 21, or recognizing the revenue in 21-22. Um, so there won't be an adjustment for the expenses in fiscal year 22-23. Okay, so that uh, takes that 200,000, moving it back to the previous year, rather than what you're showing for 22. Okay, so yeah. uh, making that correction. Uh, yep. The... Uh, the proposed, and I thought I read it was proposed, uh, temporary finance manager position. Uh, what's the process with us proceeding with that? I, I have concern with the fact that, um, what, a, a year ago or less, you were now backfilling for uh, Stephanie, and now you're going to be gone. Uh, when do we discuss this further, whether that gets real? You want me to take that, Kendra? Yeah, please. Yeah. We're going to bring that back to the next Budget and Finance Committee and have another discussion uh, and uh, see if there's a, we'll take a recommendation to the full board. Okay. Um, we wanted to put together a more detailed information for the finance committee of what this position would do. It is a, a high level uh, management, it would be a high level position in the finance mm -hmm. department. Uh, Kendra has been working with uh, uh, existing staff uh, on training uh, for her absence. And we have been uh, reaching out to temp firms to try to get some information uh, of what's available at the same time, and we plan to bring this back. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, lastly, the uh, three point, I believe it was three point two uh, million dollar grant for uh, from Department of Water Resources for Brackenbrae Forest Springs. Um, I see that recognized as revenue at this point, but no expenses. And I understand we haven't spent any of the expenses yet. However, we don't get reimbursed or we don't get anything from the grant until we spend the money. So I think recognizing that as revenue at this point, I can't understand the logic of that part of it. Can you? So the expenses are, it's in the, it's listed in the capital budget. Um, from our, from my understanding, we were planning on having that uh, completed next year. Is that correct, Rick? I think that I was talking with Josh about that. Um, Brackenbrae, Forest Springs, we're planning on having that completed. Next fiscal year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that we're you'll see, that. you'll see a line item on the okay. capital budget adjustment right. for the Brackenbrae consolidation. Um, and so that's right. why we're, um, Okay, I, I missed that it was part of expenses. I'll go back and look at that. What is the amount that we're showing for expenses then? It's in the capital budget for the amount of the grant. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I've expressed, I 
and that Rick has indicated, we're short on that. How do we begin to address that in this budget? Well, well we're short. We want to, we will not move ahead and expense uh, into the construction phases until we have more detailed from okay. the DWR. Okay. We'll submit again to DWR once we have bidded project in hand. Okay. Uh, for their if, if we have it recognized in expenses, then at that three point two, it's a zero sum. Okay. At this point. Okay. Thank you. Jamie? Thanks. Um, so I wanted to speak to the recommended increase to the um, admin, uh, the outreach budget um, being made by the administrative committee. Uh, if I could for just a moment, um, I, uh, you know, think, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a small number um, in comparison to the overall decrease that we're looking at for this fiscal year budget, but I think more to the point, and it sort of speaks to the, the issue that frankly, um, uh, our director Hill brought up, uh, that, that there is um, this, you know, substantial amount of work happening that is um, exponentially increasing as a result of all of the recovery work that the staff is doing related to the fire, our mergers, and um, in particular, one of the areas where I, I think that I've heard broad agreement on the board um, that we need to be doing more is in explaining to the public um, some of the complicated issues and choices that we're going to be facing around um, some of the, the you know, construction um, that we want to do for CZU fire recovery. Um, and, and so I, I think that uh, we are limited in our resources, and um, the only way that we're going to be able to, you know, do that is if we invest a little more um, in uh, uh, some kind of a, a consultant or, um, you know, community outreach organization who can help us um, do some of this work to, you know, get the feedback from the San Lorenzo Valley community about um, these complicated choices we're going to be facing related to these projects. So. Um, I am very much in support of increasing the budget for um, this purpose. Okay. Any other comments by members of the board? Uh, Rick, go ahead. I, I just I just wanted to uh, uh, give a, a, a bit more on what Jamie just mentioned on outreach. We will be bringing the admin committee's recommendation to the full board. Uh, on our outreach program and the formal request for an increase in budget to, uh, I do believe, the first meeting uh, in May. Okay. Any other comments by members of the board? If not, I'll go out and see if there's any comments by members of the public. And if there are, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised. Um, so at this point, we're not um, being asked for any action. Um, this was advisory to the board um, and to get your feedback. So we'll just go ahead and go on to the next um, item on the agenda, which is the Water Smart Grant Program. Yes, yes, thank you, Chair. And I'll ask uh, the, uh, the environmental planner to present this item. Okay, thank you, Greg. So this item is asking the board to sign a resolution committing to the Water Smart grant for the $100,000 grant towards replacing our water meters for AMI technology. Um, this is a 50-50 match, but we do have a budget allocated for AMI uh, meter replacement already, so it won't change anything as far as our budget. Um, we are looking to appoint uh, Rick as our signatory, and then myself or the environmental programs manager as the point of contact for the grant. Okay. Um, I think this is a pretty straightforward uh, request that we just have to appoint um, the district manager as our rep on this. But um, are there any comments from members of the board? Go ahead, Mark. Um, can I get a, a two-sentence description of how these meters work 
Um, why are these benefiting us? Are they different than the Badger meters that we've heard a lot about in the last several years? These are the Badger meters, Director Smalley. These are oh. the smart Badger Okay. A a AMI, is a, AMI is a technology. Right. Okay. All right. Acronyms Great. You're getting money for us to put the Badger meters yeah. in. Mm -hmm. Acronyms, really. Acronyms. Hey. <laughs> okay. Any comments by members of the public? I mean, th this is good news. All right, so would any members of the board like to uh, make a motion regarding the resolution? Oh. Go ahead, Jamie. Well, I, I'm happy to make a motion um, to uh, approve the resolution, but I, I did have a question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm just curious um, if approved, like uh, how, does, how, how much further down the, you know, AMI smart water meter road does this grant get us? It's approximately 600 meters. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I will uh, move the resolution um, to, uh, I'm looking for the resolution language now, sorry. Um, to appoint the district manager. Thank you, I'm gonna move the resolution to appoint the district manager as the representative uh, to be signatory and point of contact for the water As spiller. stated is the text out. of the resolution, yes. <laughs> okay. Can I have a second, please? I'll second it. Thank you. All right, um, any comments, further comments by the board? Any further comments on the motion by members of the public? Seeing none, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay. Passes unanimously. Um, that brings us to um, our next item of new business, which is uh, SLVWD financial obligations. This is an item that Bob asked to put on the agenda. And so I will let him uh, tee it up and take it away. Great, thank you, Gail. And, and thanks everybody on the board. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I assembled this information with the objective of providing additional transparency for our community, the owners of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, so they can have a better understanding of our financial position. Since the presentations in the board packet, I won't go through each slide one by one, but I want to highlight a few things for, um, for that, are, that are in the presentation. At first, the request is for the board to decide whether it wishes to pursue the topic or not. If it does, then the second request would be to select how to do that. I'm not requesting we discuss solutions today or anything like that, just whether or not we wish to pursue it and what the path would be to do that committee, staff action, what have you. Um, I've broken out the presentation into uh, on the financial obligations into two sections and summarize those in both tabular and graphic format. Section one shows the accumulated obligations to date, totaling about 29 million. Um, and it also assumes that the fire mitigation around our facilities and uh, the CZU recovery will be handled by grants and the surcharge respectively. Um, and uh, hopefully that won't change. Section two shows the capital spend required each year based on the capital asset inventory and associated lifespans. Uh, and this was built using a top-down approach, which provides a, a broader view of the, um, uh, of the capital infrastructure. It also includes other items that are in there by board policy um, and also includes debt payments, which I'm assuming are gonna be about 2 million a year for the indefinite future. And that totals about 8.8 .8 million. So to be specific, this would include the assumption of replacing one one hundredth of our pipe inventory each year um, or about 1.9 miles, assuming a hundred year lifespan for, for pipe. And current cost is about 3 million a year. Uh, section two also includes a couple of backup slides and pipe inventory and cost. Then section three shifts to looking at 
a subset of Section 2, strictly capital assets, by doing a couple of investment models. And for simplicity, I only did two. One was a level amount of capital per year, which is just under $5 million. And the second one is an irregular line. The orange line is an irregular line, which corresponds to spending about 50% of the level uh, uh, level option per year for about 75% of the life of the asset, and then uh, shifting to making up the rest of that in the last 25% of the life. So as you can see, it results in some spikes, and particularly at the end of life, um, which is driven by the pipe, it results in some pretty large spikes. Now, please note that the area under each line is the same, it's just a matter of how those costs are distributed over time. This model could be further refined by using the actual inventory. I don't have the spreadsheet with all of that data, but we could take that with the ages and put together uh, a third model of where we are based on historical spending and what our inventory looks like to see what those lines are gonna look like going forward. Um, to give an idea of what that means, if we look at the current water master plan, the 20 year spend that was in there was about 75 million. If you look at the uh, level um, option on section three, that totals about 95 million. So about 20 million more than is in the water master plan. And if you look at the irregular uh, option, that's about 47 and a half. So you can see that depending on the investment model you take, what the state of your inventory is at the time, you can wind up with some very different and in some cases perhaps under investment in capital, which I think has happened over the last 30 years and is currently being addressed by district staff and, and this board. So uh, that's the overview, uh, happy to take any uh, questions and hear comments from the board as to whether or not we wish to pursue this topic further. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, so let's go ahead and um, ask, we'll go in my alphabetical order again. Um, Jeff, you're up first if you have a comment. Unmute. You're muted. Okay, my first comment is, Bob, uh, impressive analysis. Uh, you obviously put a lot of work into this. Um, and I certainly agree we need to be transparent with our finances and do long -term, uh, a long-term uh, estimating where we're going to be. Um, I think, we, you know, we need to keep in mind that This is, I, I don't think I've seen this sort of analysis before from the board or from the, from the district. And I think we need to experiment with it a bit before we get too far into it. But I, I think the most relevant comment I can make is that with the finance director about to leave on several months of maternity leave, um, you know, my recommendation on this is going to be to, uh, bump this to the finance committee and let us wrestle with it for a while and and uh, go from there because I, I I hesitate to put this the burden of this kind of analysis on the staff while she's gone. So yeah. and uh, can I respond to Gail just really yes quickly? you may. So uh, Jeff very uh, excellent comments on that and yes one of the things I neglected to say during my introductory comments is that you know, these numbers are my best research based on open sources with one exception. And so it is very possible that these numbers, uh, in fact, it's probably almost assured that there's some numbers on there that need to be refined, updated, what have you. So um, sending it to committee would be, you know, obviously a, a, way, to, a way to go about doing that. Yeah. Okay, anything more, Jeff? No, I just, you know, it, it, like I said, it's a nice approach. It gives you a long-term view, but of course you have to keep in mind that the long-term view based on 
uh, what I, would, I guess I would call statistical analysis um, doesn't always reflect, you know, the short-term view of we just lost a pipeline and we've got to spend a lot of money on it. And so, um, you know, we've been operating on his infrastructure investment model slide. We've been operating in the on the orange line rather than the blue line. And the blue line is is useful to understand, but I'm not sure how with the kind of budgets we have, we would move to the blue line from the orange line other than for purposes of understanding where we are. So no, no solutions yet. Yeah. <laughs> Mark? You're muted. Thank you, Gail. Uh, similar to what Jeff just said, I'm an impressive analysis of the information, Bob. Uh, I commend the amount of work that you obviously have to put into this to get to that point. Um, one question that I do have on it is on in section three, uh, where you present the two different um, infrastructure investment models. Um, is is your thought? to go more towards um, a combination between these two, uh, between the level and, and the irregular, to come up with a more realistic, here's where we think we need to be spending over the next X number of years. Um, so um, not talking specifically about solutions, but in terms of perhaps an approach, Yes, I think that's what might I'm looking be getting for. at, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's so, I'm looking for approach, not a solution at this point. No. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that that occurred to me when I was creating these is that I was kind of operating, you know, as Jeff said, in, in kind of this model orientation, and and models are just that, you know, they 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 do have to be adjusted as you go along for the circumstances that you account. What I didn't have was spreadsheet information or database information on the current state of the infrastructure. So what I was doing here on both models was assuming everything starting from year zero as right. being quote new, yeah. right? And that, that just doesn't reflect reality. What, exactly. what needs to happen yeah. is we need to go back. If we want to pursue this, one of the things that we, that the budget committee or the board or whatever could consider doing is taking the, existing actual metadata for our inventory, age, mm -hmm. size, et cetera, and roll this into an updated model. That would, along with historical data of what we spent, yeah. that would give us where we are on the line. Is it above, below, et cetera? And then that would give you a foundation for how you want to go forward, either a modeling or, or not. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. That would be that would be a way to approach it. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. Truth the model to actuals. Exactly. And begin to uh, what refine to come up with an actual model versus here's the theoretical. But right. this is a framework that you're putting out. Yeah. As a, and yeah, and and I think there's there and there's implications for you know for all sorts of models. Um, yeah. And really, really what it is, is I think the board perhaps looking at this from the point of view of making decisions using explicit information as opposed to implicit or mm -hmm. heuristic information. That's basically what it comes down to. Um, to the uh, current members of the Budget and Finance Committee, um, is what Bob's proposing within the realm of what the committee can take on? Or is this a uh, an overwhelmingly large project that would need to be uh, farmed out to, to a consultant on a very, on a part-time basis or, I don't know. Or an ad hoc committee or something. Uh, or, or, yes. So, Gail, as the yeah, longer-term resident. I, I guess my response is, is that, if, especially if you're asking to 
um, take these models in section three and actualize them in terms of where we are in the uh, use life, you know, of all the different pieces of equipment that we have throughout the district, that's a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, yeah. th that and whether that's something that actually the Budget and Finance Committee should do is is the, not really, you know, it's not yeah. really within our purview. I, I, I um, because many of those things have more to do with what, you know, the engineering staff would say about the state of our infrastructure than it would. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but but let me okay. make a, a more uh, Gail, can I can I just respond to the the assertion that it, it's a huge job? Yeah. It, it you know it's a job, but if you have the inventory model with metadata of at least a um, age on the pipe or estimated age, because I know we don't have exact everywhere, and especially for pipe current size, that you would need to upgrade. It, it's actually a pretty straightforward calculation. Doesn't take a lot of time to do. Trust me, I've done these kind of things before. So I, 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 it, it's it's not it's not as overwhelming as you might think if the data is in the spreadsheet format already, which I think it is from the inventory. Yeah, I don't I don't know the state of the inventory, and I'd have to ask Rick about that. But I guess I, I I'd like to take a step back <laughs> and ask what what are we trying to you know you you can get all that information but what does that tell you and how are you going to act on it and i i've never been somebody who says you should acquire information or data unless you're going to act on it and one thing that i i guess i would dispute is this idea that um, you know you've got these two models, and and part of this is maybe has to do with um, <clears throat> spending more than forty years in academia, where usually when you do things, it's based on because you got a grant, or because somebody gave you a lot of money, and what I see for the district is that um, you know as Rick says there's never a good time. There seems to be some kind of catastrophe that hits us every few years. And that most uh, government agencies now are operating in terms of depending on large grants to do a lot of their infrastructure. And so I think the idea that we could just simply uh, you know, create that blue line by somehow either raising revenue, which would you know, to bring it up to the five million dollars Bob is talking about would be a huge increase in uh, water rates, which I don't think any of us would advocate. Um, and so, in my view, we are stuck, whether we like it or not, with with a uh, the real world, which is that we will often be controlled in terms of our expenditures by what grant funding is available. And so I, I don't think you can reach that blue line. Um, and so I, I, so there's that, that we're, we're dependent on that. And then the second look, look. thing is, is that there simply is not within our budget, the room to, for example, lower um, our expenses. Uh, you know, we're, we're a small district. Yes, we can, um, eliminate one position here or <coughs> and restructure things to save a little bit in staff money, but we're not going to find millions of dollars in staff reductions simply because we're already painfully lean. Um, and so I, I have a hard time seeing, Bob, how we're going to actualize this in the real world. And if we're not going to uh, you know, actualize it, why should we be spending staff time, um, you know, acquiring that that data? So 
Go um, ahead, Bob. I, I yeah. posed the question. You no, no, it's, it, 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 it's a fair question. I think there's, I think there's a couple really uh, good reasons for it. So, you know, there's, there's funding which the community controls, um, and by control, I mean that the community is willing to give through either um, the money it pays for water um, or bonds uh, that are placed on property values at ad valorem um, bonds. And in order for the community to make informed decisions as owners, not trade payers in that role, but as owners, they really need to have a very clear picture of what the financial position is of the district, both from a operating point of view and long-term, what kinds of things need to be handled. Um, because, and the same thing with the board, because without that, you tend to lose uh, sight of what you have to be doing over the long term. And for us as board members, um, you know, our timelines have to be in the 10, 15, 20, you know, 40 year horizon. And so without this kind of long-term planning, I, I don't know how you make those decisions very well. I would say one of the one of the one of the things past boards dropped into was by doing annual budgets just year to year, you you lose sight of what's coming. And I think that got us into the infrastructure hole that we are in or, or were in maybe a couple, three years ago that is being corrected, but it is a long-term sustainable thing. And so um, I, I just don't know how you can make really good decisions about either our multi-year budgets, where we're gonna put capital into, what have you, without having this kind of long-term view. I, I, I disagree that it's a heavy lift. It is a lift. But it's not if if the data is available, and we do have to go to Rick to to find out. It's actually a very straightforward calculation uh, to do, and I think it would be incredibly valuable for our community to understand what we're facing. The last thing I want to say is I get it about grants right now, but grants and infrastructure spending at federal and or state levels is very temporal, very transient. Um, it's here today and it's gone tomorrow, depending on who's in charge and what they plan to do. And at the end of the day, this water system is ours and we need to make sure that we are organizing ourselves over the long term to ensure that we can sustain our water district without relying on the kindness of strangers all the time, uh, because that kindness may not come our way uh, when we actually need it to happen. Jamie? Um, so I, I guess what, one of the things that I would be interested in learning, and, and first of all, I appreciate um, Jeff's recommendation that the uh, Finance Committee um, perhaps grapple with how to approach this um, and, and what parts of this might be, you know, a reasonable lift for um, the Water District staff to take on. Um, because I, I think that one concern I have is um, that sometimes we are trying to fit a round peg in a square hole, right, in the way that we look at things. And, and um, I think, you know, I, I appreciate um, that the, the lens through which Director Foltz wants to take a look at some of our financial obligations but I, I think that there are, are you know, unique factors that um, make uh, the, the, you know, concerns that we're facing different than those that you might, you know, grapple with in a private sector business, right? And so I'd really be interested to know, are there other um, similar water districts who take a similar approach? Um, and, 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 you know, what does that look like in terms of application? Because... From my point of view, I think, you know, I, I agree that we need to be transparent and, and open with the community about what our financial obligations are. I think that we're doing that. You know, I think that that we um, have talked about our, our, you know, capital obligations, um, you know, the, the rate of growth in terms of operating costs, and, you know, we're, we, we are continuing as a district to grapple with those. What makes our situation unique 
compared to that of a private sector business is that we have to continue providing services to this community, but we're in a, in a no growth environment where there's not an opportunity to bring in outside capital um, as you might have in a more typical metropolitan community where you've got con you know construction projects um, that are doing new building and, and infusing not only new capital into systems like ours, but also you know new plant. They're, they're literally rebuilding some of the plants as they're doing some of those construction projects. So we don't have the benefit of that. We have a shrinking system. We, we know, as was pointed out in, in the um, you know, operating budget report earlier, um, that we thought that we would be um, you know, reconnecting 100 uh, CZU uh, uh, properties, and we only reconnected 75. So not only have we uh, lost connections because of CZU, but we are not restoring them at the rate that we had hoped to. So we have a shrinking system that, that has to sustain all of the costs of the system, um, you know, and and I appreciate the concerns about you know how we we uh, operate in the most efficient manner, but we have thirty five staff people, and and I I would you know take a look at the um, scale of work uh, in terms of each individual staff person that has has um, increased as a result of the CZU fire. Um, I don't know where you would look for additional efficiencies if that's where we were looking to cut. So um, I appreciate the concern that, that Director Foltz is raising. I think we all share it. And I appreciate the need for transparency with, to the public about this. Um, but I'm just not convinced that the approach that um, Director Foltz is presenting is one that you know best reflects our actual circumstances, and so I'd really be interested for the finance committee to look into, um, you know, how do we answer some of these questions in a way that you know other similar water districts uh, have had to answer. I, I would um, I, I would say, Jamie, you make a lot of very fair points about the nature of our community and being in a no growth um, community is. Um, you know, for a lot of municipalities, it's it's not a normal thing. Most communities have some level of growth. Um, but there are private sector businesses that are in what are called um, stable markets, um, where, you know, really the, the businesses aren't growing that fast if they're growing at all. And in some cases, they're shrinking. And so there are things that even private sector businesses do when you're in that kind of a marketplace um, to, to address that. Um, uh, and, and and even over the long haul, um, I I would say that I think when we talk about we're shrinking, I, I mean yes, there's a 25 delta, which is about 0.3 percent of our overall subscriber base, but I expect that those the rest of those hopefully, assuming the county doesn't torture the. Uh, people trying to rebuild as much as they have been, and they do find some solutions, that, that we can get everybody back online. Um, and, and, you know, with some of the um, uh, other um, opportunities in the Scotts Valley side of our uh, district, there might be some opportunities for some, some growth there as well. Um, so again, not proposing any solutions at this point in time. I guess from my point of view, I value understanding where you are financially um, because without that, the decisions you make are not fully informed decisions. They are partially informed. And when we're talking about something as critical to life as water over the long term uh, and the challenges that we're going to be facing, that the next generation is going to be facing um, over the long term, we, we need absolute clarity around that, and uh, or at least as much as we can get in order to make sure that we are making good decisions for our children and grandchildren, the people that come after us. Um, I, I think it's a generational compact in that way. Chair May, could I clarify my, my, I just wanted to quickly clarify my comment about shrinking usage um, before Director Hill makes his comment. And, and what I meant by that, and I agree, I understand what you're saying, Bob, I agree. I would like to see all of the CZU fire, you know, homes restored. Um, but we, we have seen historically um, shrinking consumption of our um, water resources in San Lorenzo Valley, regardless of population totals over the last couple of decades. That's impacting our overall budget. 
And in addition to that, we have an aging population. And we know that as people age in place, they have smaller families, fewer people living in their homes. And so they're using fewer water resources. And so those factors combined are going to mean that I suspect we're going to continue to see um, less water consumption in our community, even as we see these um, you know, people moving back onto their properties post-fire. Not that that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. So go ahead. Looking at this, I think, and you know, when I first started looking at this, I thought, is Director Fulce telling us we should do the budget like this? But no, no. Um, and I took some notes, and one of my notes says, top-down model seems appropriate for long-term planning, but not for near-term budgeting. Near-term budgeting is a bottoms-up planning. It's what are, what, what's our current situation, and what do we have to do to keep providing water this year and the next year to the people that we serve? And so this model is to answer the question of, where are we five years from now? Or where do we need to be five or 10 or 15 or 20 years from now? And if, if we use this sort of model, and I, you know, I don't know whether we're going to or not, but if we use this sort of model, we have to be very careful to explain it very well, because here we are the board that, that looks at the budgets and we're kind of looking at it and saying, what is he trying to say to us? And I, <clears throat> You know, we want to, we need to explain it very carefully if we make numbers like this public, because someone's going to look at this and say, well, you're not spending enough here. Why don't you spend more? Or, you're, you know, they're going to look at, at the chart and think it's a, you know, a, a roadmap for the next couple of years, year by year. And it's not. It's, it's what's an average of five or 10 years worth of growth for us do we think is going to happen? And one of the things we should do uh, to follow up on Jamie, if we do build a model like this, we should build in a series of variable assumptions for consumption goes up, consumption goes down, things like that. I, you know, the question is, you know, this, this doesn't have anything to do with the next year's budget. It has to do with where do we have to be five, 10, 15 years down the road. And to that extent, I think it's a good idea, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of work still to polish this up and, and make it a useful tool. If I could say, Jeff, I, I think your your point about models being good for long term, not short term, is true. I think one of the other things that this model does bring to light is and, and what I focus on a lot in my comments about finance is what our what our operating margins are, um, because the operating margins is what drives your ability to borrow money, assuming you're not going to go for an ad valorem bond. And it also gives you an indication of what kind of capital uh, obligations you can meet with your operating margin. So in some ways they would be uh, intertwined, but yes, absolutely, you don't use long term models as the only mechanism for building a short-term budget. They, they, they kind of go together. Okay. Jeff, you still have your hand up. Did you want to add something? Oh, no, I'm okay. sloppy about, uh, no. about uh, doing that. Um, let, let me go out and see whether uh, any members of the public have anything they'd like to comment. Uh, Beth Thomas. Oops. Beth, you had your hand up and then, okay. All right. Let's, let's let Beth speak. Holly, can we get the CTB folks to. Patrick, can we get uh, a lot? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mahu. Um, I, I just like to uh, make a couple of observations. Uh, the public does pay attention to what happens on a long term basis. And sometimes it's looking backward. And that's where I think we've gotten into trouble in the past. Um, because they do look at things like how long the, the detention center tank was leaking water for, you know, years. Uh, I, I think 
also the value of a long-term plan, whatever the model ends up being, is that the, the constitution of the board changes, the composition, I'm sorry, of the board changes. If you look right now, we have three new members in the, since the last election. Uh, if you don't have some kind of a structure that helps guide that, and you have such turnover of board members, then it is very easy for these things to, you know, be based on, you know, the budget for the next six months or the year or whatever, whatever it is. I think it's important to look ahead and to have some kind of a guiding structure um, because we can't count on all things being the same for for your period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Any other uh, comments from the public? Okay. Uh, not. We'll go back to the board and see if there's any other uh, comments, um, or whether anybody would like to make a motion about anything. Uh, Bob, I'd just like to make one comment before uh, the board takes action or not, regardless of which way it goes. And that's why I wanted to get in before anything happened. I want to thank the board a lot for your attention to this and what I think was a really excellent discussion about this topic. Um, so uh, if we don't do something now, we might you know, do it later. But I think this kind of discussion periodically is really, really healthy and, and really good for the board as it, particularly as we start moving into the next budget cycle. So thank you for, for your time on this. And thank you for putting all that information together as you did. Okay, any other um, comments or motions or anything that want anybody wants to do? Mark. Yes, um, I've heard uh, our newest board member for all of uh, what, two hours now, uh, opining to uh, the, the benefits of having this very forward-looking model. Um, with Bob saying it's not that much effort to put something like this together if we have the data. I don't know whether we, I don't know whether we have the data or not. From my view, this is a pretty heavy lift, but I am fairly uninformed uh, on financial modeling. What I would like to suggest is is it appropriate for the Budget and Finance Committee to assess what, and with discussions from staff, assess what would this take to come up with a, a realistic capture of information that we have in-house to be able to get there? So I, I don't know if that's... Uh, a motion, a suggestion. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that that's reasonable, Mark, that, that and basically asking uh, the budget and finance to assess that and then come back to the board and yes. report. Um, because yes. I think, it, you know, it'd be hard tonight to try to figure that out, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not expecting that. Yeah, what, yeah. I mean, what we, Bob we was... need to talk to Rick, to, jo to Josh, to, you yes. know, to everybody. Yes. Um, so if, if you want to make that a, a motion to recommend, uh, well, go ahead, say, say it the way you want to say it. <laughs> okay. I'd like to motion that um, we forward the information that Bob has provided to the Budget and Finance Committee and have that committee assess the data that's available within the district, how difficult it is to get that, what's there, what's not there, in order to be able to put together a model uh, like this. And I would hope that based on the questions from Director Hill um, and what appears to me to be the knowledge of it, there's somebody uh, knowledgeable on financial modeling there that would be able to better guide this discussion on, okay. the, on the committee. So. Is there a second? I'll second it. No one else can. Okay. 
Is there any discussion of the motion? Jeff, you look quizzical. No? No. Nope. <laughs> okay. nope. All right. Uh, Scratching my head here. All right. How about uh, members of the public? Okay. Um, we have a motion on the table. Go ahead, Holly, and uh, ask for a vote. President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Pulse. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. All right. Um, we now come to unfinished business, and the first item is long service line agreement. Uh, go ahead, Greg. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, at the last board meeting, you saw this uh, request for the first time for a long service line agreement for APN 077-032-25. Um, inadvertently, the agreement was not attached to the memo. Tonight, you have the memo again, and the agreement should be in your packets for the long service line agreements for your review. May I just say I apologize for the, um, the there seems to be an extra line in that item on the agenda. When I was cutting and pasting, I missed something. I apologize. Well, the, agree the agreement's attached. Um, okay, Bob? Yeah, I, so when I was looking at the agreement, it looked, so I, in the almost four years I've been on here, we've done a number of these. And when I was looking at the agreement, it looked um, different. And so I went back in history and on uh, the board meeting of December 16th, 2020, um, I recall that we, and I validated by looking up, that we'd actually made some changes to that older agreement to eliminate some of the ambiguity around the term of the agreement and also to eliminate the restriction which I, I find personally objectionable that a person on a long line service agreement can no longer participate in discussions surrounding infrastructure that might directly impact their property. Um, we, we had had a fairly lengthy conversation about this. And at the time the board had adopted this new template for the, um, I believe it was for uh, Stephen Hunt on Western States Road. And it was my understanding that we were going to use that agreement as the template going forward, um, it, be, because it does clear up, a, uh, clean up a lot of things. I think even Gina might even look at it uh, and and cleaned it up. Right now, for example, the term of the agreement, the maximum term, is eight years, the way that it's written, which means after eight years it would all expire anyway. And I don't think that was the intention uh, of the agreement. Certainly wasn't in the re in the reworking of the term um, statement. So uh, you know the board could certainly proceed with the long line agreement previous, but it would be then going back to something after we had already changed it for the last one that we did. Rick or Gina, do you want to address this? Well, I'm trying to pull up that the director Fultz. I I know that. These agreements have had an issue at board level in the past. And I'm not sure what changes have been made. I'm not, and I'm not sure if district council. Um, well, for, for example, section 11 was stricken entirely from the agreement in, in front of us in the current agenda. If you compare that against the December 16, 20, it, it's simply not there. Gina, do you want to comment? I, I do have word versions of the documents that we did in um, late 2020 and early 2021. So, okay, you have them, but are you saying that, um, I guess my question, I guess what Bob's asking is, um, are, is there some reason that we went back to a previous version or is, it, or is that just an accident or, or was it a judgment call that we wanted 
you know, the, the changes that were made in December 2020 were ones that you didn't like, and so we went back to a previous version. I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. I don't think that's the case. I, I think, was, as I recall, that section section 11 was the was an issue at the time, and we talked about removing that from the agreement. And Rick, moving Rick, forward. Josh was Josh, the district engineer now was not the district engineer at that time. So that could be the reason for confusion and the use of a different document. He could exactly right. That's my thoughts is that he pulled an agreement, you know, from a, a previous one. Um and we didn't catch that. And I'm you know, and I'd have to go back and look at the, the reason the term is only five years. Um well, with an extension for three more, but that's it. Right. Holly? You see, there were, that, that language was changed in the t December 2020 document. Right. Holly? And, and Holly would have used what Josh gave him or gave her. She wouldn't have. Okay. Holly, did you want to comment? Well, I, I did want to make one comment, and that was um, at the last meeting, um, Bob asked if, uh, you know, this was urgent and um, Josh said, no, it wasn't. But in the meantime, I've spoken with Mr. Clark and he's nearly out of water. Yeah, this, this he is, is very urgent. anxious. This is an emergency. He needs to get that, get the pipe in the ground. He's going to put it in tomorrow if this goes through. He's set up for that. So just for your information. Huh? If we proceed with this tonight, because we certainly don't want anybody to go without water, can we then... Um, Terminate yes. that agreement and substitute the new one. Yes, and I will, we'll work with council. Um, and we would not let this individual run out of water, especially as it appears that we're moving forward. Um, yeah, because I want to do it for sure. I mean, this is a no brainer yeah. at the conceptual level. Okay. Well, let, let's go. Is Would anybody like to move that we adopt the resolution? Because it sounds like we need to do that so that this gentleman doesn't have a problem with water and then we can come back and redo it if necessary. Mark? Yes, I'd like to make that motion. We approve the resolution with the um, addendum that we do revise the agreement so that it reflects the most current language that apparently was agreed to back in 2020 when this issue was discussed previously, as Bob is pointing out. I'll second that. Any further discussion? How about from the public? Seeing none, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, the final uh, item uh, is uh, remote meeting authorization. And um, this is, well, go ahead, Gina. Um, I think I'll let the memo speak for itself unless. Um, any member of the board the public has questions or wants to discuss. The, um, the ask is the same as um, as always, which is to uh, that the board adopt a motion ratifying and readopting the attached resolution number 42122. Okay, so I'm I'll going make. to move that we ratify and readopt the attached resolution so that it continues in effect for another 30 days. I'll second that. Second? Second. Okay, any discussion by the public? Hearing none, seeing none, go ahead, Holly. And President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director Fulz. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Resolution passes. Next, we have the consent agenda. Um, Anybody want to discuss that? If not, we will go on to district reports. 
Any comments or questions on district reports from members of the board? Mark? Yes, on the environmental department status report, um, Carly, you mentioned uh, the conjunctive use draft from RINCON that was being presented to the e and &E committee in April. Uh, I don't believe that happened. What's the status on that? That's correct. I'm sorry, that was must have been a typo there. Um, it looks like we'll, we're in line right now to be able to bring the project description to the committee in June. Um, with the upcoming committee, we probably won't have it ready in time. Um, there's quite a bit of internal conversations happening about our negotiations, negotiations with the city of Santa Cruz and then also how mm -hmm. we want to operate when we move forward with the expanded conjunctive use. Okay, thank you. Bob? I have a number of um, questions. Do, do you want to go through one report at a time or just all the reports at this time? Go ahead. Um, uh, first question is on engineering report, the Felton Heights tank project. Um, Rick, I think the there was a community meeting being organized. Is, do I have that right? And has that taken place? If yeah, that we, was the goal. we have been working with the community of Felton Heights um, over the last few weeks um, and we're working with the property owner that is uh, offered the, uh, the new tank easement. Um, I've met with the president of the homeowners association and other folks uh, out in lost acres. We're looking, there's concern with the, the, the existing tank site or the, the, not the existing, but the, the proposed tank site, there's concerns and the property owner asked if we would look at a potential another location. So we have been looking at an alternative location to the proposed location, which is basically out of sight and out of mind of the neighborhood further up uh, on, on this person's property. Um, engineering and operations were out there this week. Um, they've looked at it. They're going to uh, shoot some elevations to make sure to see if the elevation will work for us. Uh, and if the elevation will work for us, we will go back to the property owner and talk about a alternative easement. But we are working in the neighborhood and trying to move this project ahead. Have we done a lot of engineering work on or environmental work on the proposed, the current proposed tank site? No, we have not. That would be the next step once we obtain the easement, then we would release the environmental um, Probably an ISMND would be most likely on that project. Okay, great, thanks. Um, uh, Carly, a couple questions on, well, actually a comment in yours. Thanks for breaking out the year into a separate column on the grants. So that'll make it easier to do the pivot that I wanted to do. And um, on the PG&E work, which um, looks like it's been completed, uh, is, and, and is there a place I can go to see where it is in, in the water, Olympia watershed so I can go take a look? Because I'd like to see the, the result. Yes, definitely. Um, so if you're familiar with our Olympia watershed, uh, very close to well one, which is kind of near where the horse gate is to go on the upper loop trail. If you yep. go to the right from there, if you're facing the well, you can see all the planting that they've done. Um, as well as the broom removal. And if you walk a lot of those paths that were in the past very uh, inundated by the French broom, you can see that there's a very clear difference just looking into uh, the, the forested areas where you can actually see it in there. Um, there's no longer the broom kind of taking up all the extra space. Um, well, that's, that's really great, fantastic. And hopefully we can keep that one up. Um, Carly, can you send him a map, Carly, for that location so it's easier sure. to find? Uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, the next one is in Kendra's report. I see we have a small uptick in our um, uh, arrearages, but it's not huge. So as long as we stay relatively stable, I think we're we're at least treading water until some of that gets resolved, hopefully through uh, state money. Um, on the 
there, there was a question, Kendra, on page 94, the operating analysis, February 2022. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not sure what the takeaway in this is. I'm, I'm, I'm and, and maybe this is just the something I hadn't noticed before and, and uh, was looking at it again today, but it looks like the comparisons are all done um, against prior year, but it doesn't look like there's a comparison of where we are versus the budget, uh, at least in this one. And, I, and so I was kind of wondering what the takeaway is for this report. What should we be focused on uh, in this report as the key items? Because just looking at a percentage of current month is, I, I mean, it's great, but I, you know, I'm, I'm much more concerned about percentage against budget, particularly when it comes to water usage, which I know we are behind on. So are you saying you would like to add a column comparing against the budget for that particular month because there is a column to the right comparing against the budget against the annual budget um, but are you interested in looking at what it should be for that particular month well yeah because when you look at the annual budget you know there's a lot of variability in water use right it's very seasonal and so mm -hmm. I, I can't if, if you're looking in February and you're comparing it against the full year budget you know, great, we're at 64%. Does that mean we can get 36% in the last four months or, or not? And, right. and I, I'm, it's a little hard for me to really assess how we are relative to um, that particular point in time. Um, now, I guess the question is, if you don't have the information available or it's a huge lift, then that's a, a different thing. But I, it, it was just a little bit, and I think I probably focused on this because of my earlier question of, can we make up that operating margin in the last four months? And so that's why I focused in on this. And then I saw, well, I can't really tell exactly because we're comparing it against annual. It's not an apples and apples comparison at that point. Right. So we, we do have the data, the monthly data for what's budget, like budgeted units. Um, so I could add that into the report. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, maybe the budget committee could take a look at report formats too at some point is um, might be another idea too. But yeah, it would help me, but I don't know if it would yeah. help everybody else. And I don't I don't want to make a demand that might not be helpful to everybody else. So, um, okay. Okay. On the page 96 on the operating analysis year to date trend, um, you know, we are including the surcharge in this report. And from an operating revenue point of view, you know, the surcharge is in that kind of funny area because, you know, officially, according to GAAP, it's operating revenue, but according to board policy, it really can't be used for operating expenses. So it, it's really not operating revenue at a practical level. Um, and, and I just found that when we include it in these reports like this, it distorts where we actually are on our operating margin, which again, for me is, is, is critical. Um, it, it, does that make sense? I, I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I could put something under operating income, excluding fire recovery surcharge to kind of that, show. Yeah, I mean, just adding a line in that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, the report for, for um, James, uh, James, I know we're in the middle of our annual flushing, which is is good. Do we capture the approximate amount of water that's used for flushing when we're looking at our water loss for, for the year? Yes, we do. We calculate that by gallons per minute as we're flushing the hydrant by the time that we are flushing the hydrant. Okay, great. Um, on the meter replacement program, it might be great. I think this kind of gets to question Jamie asked earlier if we had some historical graphs on uh, how many uh, meters we're installing per year or, or per quarter or something like that. I think that might give a, a sense of, of, of where we are and maybe relate that to the total number of meters that we have. Um, I, th I think it's moving to the Badger meters is just gonna be great for the district overall and it, it just might help provide a little more context. Yeah, as stated in the last board meeting with the meter report, I mean, on average, we're doing 500 a year. 
Okay. So, I mean, but yes, I could definitely put a graph together of how many we've done each year. Um, on the maintenance issues, it, it would, you know, again, this goes to looking at operational metrics. Um, I don't know if there's any way to normalize this information to make the maintenance issues, you know, small, medium, large, what have you, try to figure out how much of those you're doing. But it, it, it you know, I like the fact that we have the maintenance issues identified. I just don't know how to look at that from an operational metrics point of view. Um, well, it, a, I, how I format that is just to kind of give an idea of the time spent by the maintenance team of, with all those projects going on and then all the other stuff going on with meter change out and the normal projects, you know, for the month, that gives an idea of how much time is spent and where the time is allocated. Well, I, you know, I, and I, I understand that it, it doesn't have any specific time in here necessarily, I, but I get what you're trying to get to. I would be interested in, yes, understanding what percentage of, the staff's time is spent on, on maintenance issues versus, you know, construction or infrastructure or what have you. I, I, I can't really get a sense of that from, from the report as it's currently stated, other than, you know, you've done 16 leaks and, and these items. It, it, it's hard to gauge what that means relative to staff utilization. Understood. Okay, that's it, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on the district reports? How about from members of the public? No? All right, then um, if there are no objections, I think it is time for us to adjourn. And thank you all for your efforts tonight. Hi, everyone. So Cedric, I have 9.10 for adjournment time. Thank you very much.